You're listening to Once Upon a Time at the Movies, a retrospective podcast where we look back at a classic film and take a deep dive into its history, discuss how it put its stamp on Hollywood, share our own thoughts with a superfan special guest, and ask the question, how does this classic still hold up today? Let's dive in. Once upon a time in 1973, audiences were charmed to death by Barbra Streisand and Robert Redford as Katie and Hubble, two fundamentally contrasting lovers in what is helmed as one of the greatest romances of all time, celebrating its 50th anniversary this month. I'm your host, Juan Ayala, television and film critic over at MediaVillage.org and host of the podcast Actors with Issues, here to talk with all of you about the way we were. And joining us for this trip to the movies is my dear friend, Anthony Sanchez Solis. Anthony, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited. Uh, so tell the folks a bit about yourself and why you are such a cinephile. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, well, my name is Anthony. Uh, I grew up in the Midwest, specifically rural Iowa. And I think my my favorite memory of the movies is when my mom went to Walmart and she bought, you know, top 10 or top 20, like greatest film soundtracks of all time. And it had so many classics on there, like, the, the Godfather theme song, it had, you know, Moon River from Breakfast at Tiffany's, it had uh, Tara's theme from Gone with the Wind and The Lord of the Rings, etc. And I remember just being so mesmerized by music. Music and film have always been so close to my heart. And so eventually I started making my way down the list and watching all the historical, historically revered and iconic films. Um, and I would go to the library and check them out, you know, on VHS. And they would have all the old movies and they're like unremastered editions and I completely fell in love with them. So obviously neither of us were around in 1973 when the movie came out 50 years ago. So when did you first see the movie and what was it about it that hooked you and like what what was it about it that made such an impact on you? Oh my goodness. So I actually, you know, in, in getting ready for this for this episode, I was looking at my notes because I always write notes for films and like I, I have my my little letterbox account. And I remember I watched it in late October of last year. So actually, I don't know. I, it's something in me must have known something about its anniversary. And I watched it because I'm such a big fan. We can get into that later of uh, Sex in the City. And so it's mm -hmm. it's referenced in there. It's a big pop culture moment in in the show. And having gone actually, you know, through a very similar relationship as depicted in that show, I was like, I'm gonna watch this movie. It's very pivotal to to Carrie Bradshaw's character arc. And I watched the film, and I was so, I I was mesmerized. I was touched. I felt every single emotion because I essentially watched what I had just gone through a very tumultuous relationship play out on screen, and I very much identified with. Uh, Barbara Streisand's character, Katie. And so I I fell in love with all of it. It was very much almost like it was a character analysis of the person I had been with and of myself at the same time. I I couldn't believe it. It was representation, truly. <laughs> <laughs> in ways more than one. But, you know, with mm -hmm. this movie, I, as you know, I have not seen a lot of the classics. I grew up with immigrant parents. They did not expose me to anything in terms of music or film or pop culture. So I watched this for the first time last night, as you know. And just quick review, I mean, I, I loved it. How can you not love this movie? It's just, it just brought me back to this era in Hollywood where studios would risk a couple million dollars. Mind you, back then, $5 million 50 years ago is very different than today. But, you know, I feel like rom-coms these days still cost like, I don't know, 25, 30 million. Um, but they're just not made like that anymore. You see rom-coms end up on streaming platforms or netflix where it's like low risk they don't have to worry about promotion and distribution and all of that it's like nope it'll just live here but you know folks have talked so much about uh the lack of movie stars these days how uh, like there are no true young movie stars that are box office jaws like yes they're critically acclaimed but they're not bringing audiences in like the way we were had a five million dollar budget and made 10 times that at the box office Rom-coms don't really do that unless it's like a Crazy Rich Asians or my big fat Greek wedding mm -hmm. or one of those like sort of cultural touchstone types of movies. But um, yeah, I just absolutely loved it. I mean, the score, again, it just brought me back to when there were themes in every movie and it's like throughout the thing and every movie had a song that could be nominated for an Oscar for best song or a, a score like Marvin Hamlish doing a romance like this. Like we don't have composers doing that anymore. You know, it's like pop soundtracks or whatever. They'll just put in some generic strings, but like 
Marvin Hamlish, I mean, EGOT, you know, just like a, a complete, you know, we're getting a bit too into the weeds here, but um, yeah, I absolutely no, loved no, it. That's and, okay. and that sort of sentiment it left on me was just like missing that old Hollywood that mm-hmm. just isn't around anymore. No, I agree. I, I mean, even when I saw the movie and it was like Marvin Hamlish in the credits, I was like, wait, what is he doing here? <laughs> Ariana, what are you doing here? <laughs> it was like, cause I, cause I'd seen, I think ordinary people a few mm. like years ago and he also wrote the theme for that so he was very busy during the 70s with that and of course yeah. yeah it was a very big era for him I forget there's a couple other things that I'm just being on I mean he collaborated with Barbara a lot he wrote a lot of music for her and I mean they're one of those like partnerships that's just like it's like Spielberg and um mind you I, mean, I, was, I was my god stuttering I was about to say that Barbara's not a director but that's totally not true she totally directed herself in many films mm-hmm. I think Yentl she directed Yentl did she yep yeah so? yeah um, <laughs> yes <laughs> her and Hamlish is very much like you know John Williams and Spielberg like they just their films have that sound and and it's just like low-key the films might not be what they are without that sound um and vice versa you know I agree. I actually think that one of the best parts of the movie and like on this rewatch, I was just so appreciative of the song of the core theme. Yeah. I mean, even and we're, we'll get into the plot, but like the way that the the song starts, I mean, it's just it's so beautiful. She's like brushing his hair and she's like almost remembering and she's like yeah. closing her eyes and you you see these parallels in the opening credit scene, which I think is one of the most brilliant opening credit scene. It's a great use of the song. One of the most recent examples of a film that has a core theme like that, that's used throughout the film, um, which is surprising. I didn't even notice until my most recent watch, which was my third one, was Barbie. I didn't realize how much, Oh. Um, what was I made for? Is that the name of the song? Um, yep. I didn't realize really how wish. often that's used throughout the entire movie. I thought it was just the song itself at the end, but every time Barbie's like having those, like she's connecting with, America Ferrer's character and seeing her memories, that theme is playing. I was like, oh my God, that's like the song, that's the theme. And it realized that like, they did such a good job of doing that. It's like, as surrealist and over the top and hilarious as that movie was, it is very touching in that sense. I know that the movie has a huge impact on you. We'll talk about it in five years when it's his five year anniversary. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but um, before we break the movie down, um, I just want to get a bit into a deep dive into sort of the making of the film. So. Uh, apparently, Streisand and Redford had completely different approaches to acting. So Streisand, obviously being a woman of the theater, um, she wanted to analyze the script and really rehearse a lot. So while Redford opted for spontaneity, because he felt that the more he rehearsed, the more stale his performance got. So I love that the differences in their approach to acting clearly just fueled the differences that their characters had. And that's mm-hmm. why like their chemistry is just so palpable. Like that, that to me, this is like, screams you know eons of like why the movie worked the way that it did and uh the way we were remains one of the few films that tackles the hollywood blacklisting era in which a lot of actors directors and other talent would be banned from working in television in motion pictures and um the screenwriter arthur lawrence who also wrote the book that the novel is based on he was among the many that was blacklisted during that period so this is like the novel a bit more is like loosely based on his college years during that era of McCarthy and then later during McCarthyism. And he actually wrote a play in the 90s, which finally got its production in the 90s, um, called Jolson Sings Again. And he was quoted in an interview with Playbill. He said, they cut stuff out of my screenplay for The Way We Were, which had a portion devoted to the McCarthy era. I hadn't said all I wanted to say. So in Jolson Sings Again, which is the play, uh, the people betray each other on many different levels and it damages lives. And it was that larger point that I wanted to bring up more in the play. So it's interesting that he still got the chance to tell that part of the story that was edited out. Because I think Barbara also said in an interview, there were two very pivotal scenes that harped on that a lot. But the movie was already two hours long, which back then was like running a bit mm-hmm. long for a romance, at least. Um, mm-hmm. It's not now where everything's like three hours. But um <laughs> there was a few scenes that she said she was very heartbroken that they cut out because it was touching on the blacklist period and she was really devoted to telling that story as well but they just cut it for time sadly i totally wish we could have seen that you know some more acting chops uh from barbara that would have been so cool to see 
Yeah. And there's actually, because those scenes were cut a few, um, I believe one of the scenes or one of the sequences was a tiny part of it was left in the movie. It's when they're about to watch a film and the screen comes down and they find out the room is bugged with like a mic um, that that sequence was apparently much, much longer, but they cut it down for time. And there were two actors who were in that who had more pivotal roles that were basically cut down to almost nothing because that was cut down. So that's really a shame as well. They had cast sort of like I, slightly known actors and they were cut down. Uh, do you know who like those actors were or anything about their roles? Because I did feel like there could have been a few essential characters missing. Yes. So um, apparently, according to IMDb, which we all take with a grain of salt because people can submit things. Um, but a lot of this is taken from interviews and whatnot. But it says uh, the segment mm -hmm. dealing with the McCarthy witch hunts had much more screen time. However, the segment was cut to the bone. The chief victims of the cuts were Vivica Lindfors and Murray Hamilton, whose roles were turned into brief bit parts. So uh, breaking down the story of the way we were. So the story is told over a few decades, beginning in the mid 1940s as World War II is coming to an end. Katie Morosky, played by Streisand, uh, works at a radio station in New York City, and she reconnects with an old friend, Hubble Gardner, who is played by Robert Redford, as he returned to the US after serving as a naval officer during the war. The first the two first met in college in the late 1930s, where Katie was a staunch anti-war activist on campus and Hubble was a privileged, waspy, aspiring writer. The two befriend one another and grow comfortable to share their true thoughts and feelings with each other. And as time goes on and the rise of McCarthyism, the Hollywood blacklisting and accusations of, co of communism, Katie's political activism resurfaces while Hubble remains apolitical in order to not put his career in jeopardy as a screenwriter in Hollywood. Katie becomes pregnant. Hubble has an affair and the two eventually part ways for their own sakes as Katie realizes that Hubble is not the man she idealized in her mind and Hubble comes to term that Katie is not the woman to conform or assimilate into gender roles. The movie does not get the classic Hollywood romance happy ending of the two lovers ending up together but they instead go on with their lives as they idealize for themselves and not for each other. A lot more happened in this movie but it would have been like just me reading for five minutes but <laughs> that did you write that yourself? That was such a beautiful summary. I did. I'm a writer. Can you tell? Oh my gosh. I love that. I, I feel like you really got to the bone of what the movie is and just everything I've ever felt mm. about why it attracts me. That that was yeah. very succinct. That was very beautiful, Juan. Thank you. Goodness. Um, I feel, you know, I feel like this movie touches on or touches so many people because of that sort of thing of idealizing people it's like you think they're going to change they think you're going to change and then you're at like a stalemate like it's a gridlock and no one's going to change because you just are the way you are and having mm -hmm. to make those decisions of like am i going to keep torturing myself and them expecting things to change or are we going to just come to terms with what's going on and put each other out of our misery not put each other out of our misery but you know cut things off while like before it gets worse you know it sounded very uh terminal i, I mean, don't, go I don't back know on. sometimes sometimes that relationship gets so bad that's the only way out <laughs> for some people <laughs> yeah. like very extreme cases yeah so uh we already talked a bit um, about you know what we love about the movie but um looking back at it what parts stand out to you the most what 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 are the likes and then the grapes Oof, I feel I feel like I'm definitely going to go back to like what I like about the movie so much because a lot of it, it was, I mean, I, I had just gone through such a confusing and like I said, tumultuous is the perfect way to describe the relationship I'd gone to. So I feel like a lot of it, I was still confused with such a murky period where I didn't know how to understand how to analyze the relationship, how to feel about it, whether I was in the wrong, whether he was in the wrong. And so having these feelings, you know, put on screen and like, you know, having Katie do a lot of the things I did where, you know, she just, and I, and I can bring up examples, you know, just, I, I have my, my notepad, I can bring up examples. <laughs> <laughs> this is very serious to me. But um, when, you know, when she, when she takes those, those damn sleeping pills with the wine, I, I remember very vividly, you know getting high extremely high to to you know i took an edible it's legal where i live uh for, you know i i took way too much that i should not have and i called my ex you know similar to how she did and you know when he's he arrives you know she says almost verbatim what i'd ask you know my partner not to overshare but she says it's because i'm not attractive enough is it i know i'm attractive sort of i'm not attractive in the right way am i 
And I remember watching that and feeling such secondhand embarrassment as well as sympathy. And I was like, oh, yeah. baby, let's put down that wine and go to therapy. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is so bad. But there were there were so many scenes like that where, you know, when either when she's like moving all her plans to like cook him a big roast dinner, you know, because he yeah. he might stay over he'll stay over and she wants to make him happy or you know she's frenetically like you know commandeering you know ship at like the radio station and she's telling everyone what to do and you know she's very in control she's loud and then when he calls she becomes small you know the smallest version of herself there's all these little glimpses where I saw myself and what I've been doing and in my relationship that I I felt so sad and I almost I also recognize that I never should have become that person so I mean mm-hmm. there's there's many moments I can go into as you give me more questions but I think that's one of my favorite things about it just the dynamic the contrasting of their personalities and how yeah. that leads to you know she she almost holds him up as this Adonis figure where you know in that story Adonis can't look at himself because if he looks at himself he'll find you know all these things that things that he's afraid of and I feel like Cobble is very similar in that way he's yeah. afraid to look inward yeah this is definitely a type of movie that for anyone who you know has even just like generally had their heart broken or if 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 you're like me you sort of believe in like the multiverse and whatnot it's like oh like we're not supposed to end up together in this universe but there's one out there where we do and best wishes to mm-hmm. them but it's not here if you just believe that or if you've had that sort of experience with someone like this movie just like forget tugs of the heart it's ripping out your arteries it's (laughs) it's just like it's one of those things that by the end you're just like oh my god you just want them to end up together because it's a hollywood romance but not every movie can Mm -hmm. have that happy ending it's sort of like there was one other film where I was talking recently with someone about it. it's like oh like if only they had like if only it didn't end with the happy ending but this is almost like not to nerd <laughs> out because they, they thought like the movie would have been better if oh. they didn't you know because it's like oh they ended together okay cool cheesy whatever but it's like wasn't a touching moment because it didn't feel mm-hmm. earned while in this one you're like they earned it they totally earned it come on like they they tried and you know people just stay in their ways, but it's not to nerd out, but it's almost like at the end of Avengers Infinity War where they lose. And you're just like, wait, what? (laughs) And with this one, they don't win. He doesn't win the girl. She doesn't win the guy. You're just like, oh, (laughs) you're just like, is there a part two? Like, please let there be a part two where they do end up together. I I really like that you feel that way, but I'm also wondering, and I'm probably a bit biased given, you know, what I said, but I don't, I think she deserves better than Hubble. Yeah, I think, exactly. You know, I think neither party, and, and this is something that's so interesting to me whenever I've read about the film, because I've read about it so extensively, it's one of my favorites. Mm. It's that I, it's, it's always commonly said, you know, neither would change for the other. But I really think it was Katie who like, didn't want, you know, who I mean, who was changing consistently. And it was Hubble that would refuse to change. And I think that in in that sense, I, I mean, you could even argue that Hubble changed by when they broke up, you know, and he came over and she was she was rambling to him. He did change because he sort of like gave in to her request to continue the relationship and that she would change for him. Hmm. So I guess maybe he knew in the end that it wouldn't work all along. I don't know, maybe I, I, I think that these two people he just came from such a privileged background I I think I wrote that on this rewatch I finally thought to myself that Hubble didn't really care or see how he was affected because it's to a very minimal degree and he wants such you know little interruption to his life and his comfort but Katie's able to see how his life is affected and how it can improve if only he ever stood up for something anything even you know himself and I think it, it was such a great movie to watch especially this year given you know the strikes and the protests you know for such better, you know, working conditions, especially in Hollywood, given, you know, the setting of the yeah. film. And I thought you, I, I, I'm eager to know if you saw any callbacks to our time today and how you felt about that. Oh, for sure. I mean, you know, what they were protesting and whatnot was much more of like what was going on overseas, but, you know, she totally, if Katie were alive today, she would have been on the front lines of the, you know, in front of Paramount, in front of Universal and all these like big studios and 
fighting for equal rights mind you not to get too much into the strike but it's like this isn't the first time that this sort of strike has happened it happens every time there's a shift in the industry and it's just like mm -hmm. why are we why do we have to strike every time there's a shift why is it not sort of built in it happened at first when vhs tapes came out and writers and actors wanted residuals for video sales especially during video rentals that's how a lot of movies a lot of movies went straight to video and then it happened again with dvds and now wow. it's streaming you know you're bragging about a show being number one and it's like, okay you're you're getting how many subscribers and making how many billions of dollars off of the show and no one's getting compensated besides you know the the ceo who gets a nice big bonus for writing a check it's just it's so backwards and totally something katie would be fighting for um today and then and honestly i think that maybe uh hubble would too because as a writer he would want to be fairly compensated so i think they would have joined forces on that one I think you just described the multiverse in which eventually their <laughs> love is able to overcome their political differences because Katie's fighting for something that he, you know, clearly he's on, they're on the same page on an issue. Him. Finally, like they're that's finally on because it on affects him directly. Um, <laughs> that's only why I. Yeah, it was it was very curious. It was it almost felt like a trap. And I, I, I wonder if you see it that way when, you know, he came back home and he's asking her, like, are you going to go? Are you going to take the baby? And he yeah. seems to be okay with it. And then it, later he's like, no, you know, and they have this whole like fight, you know, at the train station, which is kind of iconic. Yeah. Um, there was a, apparently there was a moment in the script that was cut that Arthur Lawrence, the screenwriter was very upset about. Um, so it says here, uh, Arthur Lawrence fought to keep the exchange. I want us to love each other. The trouble is we do oh. two separate lines. Lauren said that the line, quote, summed up the relationship between Hubble and Katie. They loved each other despite, not because. To Lauren's dismay, Cindy Pollack, director, ended up cutting the line. The problem, Lawrence claimed, was that the man who was directing a political love story knew even less about love than he did about politics. Shade. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> only, only a writer could have, could have, could have come yeah. up with that. Only a gay really icon in Hollywood, in Broadway would <laughs> um i wanna is it okay for me to bring up like my possibly my favorite line yeah in, of course in the in the movie that i think really sums it up i don't know if you caught it um like the full line i i really think it sums up the film as a thesis and it also does a great job of elucidating like you know how much they loved each other was it despite was it because in the beginning you know when they're at when they're in class and they're both in the same class and they're both writers and his his story gets selected which felt very much like almost a nod of like you know the, the white privilege of like or pre even pretty privilege of like this person's getting chosen yeah. you know they may be talented but are they more talented and you know and and i love that the contrast in the story is this waspy blonde you know very handsome man i mean robert redford is dreamboat <laughs> gorgeous he is stunning stunningly hot there's a reason he got away with doing everything he did in that film right and then there's then there's barbara in i mean obviously babs is beautiful but you know in in that time it's it's so interesting to see how they portrayed you know this this division of like she's this working class you know jewish girl and she's not you know she has curly hair and she's complicated and she's not carol ann you know who has straight hair and she's you know this classic beauty and so they're they're in the they're in they're in class and his story gets selected, and he the the line that opens his story is in a way he was like the country he lived in, everything came too easily to him, but at least he knew it. About once a month he was worried he was a fraud, and I think later there's also the, the ending quote is well there's no really you know reason for us to change, but of course by then. They were too lost or too lazy. It had always been too easy, no. and I don't know if, if you if you caught that. Like I didn't catch the, the ending end, of that. It's, it's, no. Yeah, the end. It's like that's how big and crazy of a fan I am. It's like it's like in fade out. You know, it's only if you have the subtitles on. Right. No, that's exactly why I didn't hear it. Because <laughs> I know they started playing the theme and again during that part, and the his audio faded out. Yeah. <laughs> I just I I I think even I haven't comprehended or delved into why you know, he, how, how that line affects, you know, the rest of the, the story. I, I wonder even if it's in the novel as like part of the writer's prose itself, mm -hmm. it's just so beautifully written, but I love that line. And having written along similar things, I think there's 
a few lines sometimes that as a writer you kick yourself you know in the face for not having come up yourself because it's so brilliantly eloquent like it's so eloquent and it articulates something that you've been spending you know most of your life to describe and mm-hmm. this would be the line for me because I think it describes so many things about the idealization of someone who is not you know of you who's have a higher status perhaps or like uh higher looks and, and also just like our, the country and our country itself and in Hubble you know at, at the heart of it I I just I I love the quote and particularly because it conveys a bit of self-awareness of Hubble that he knows mm-hmm. he's been granted this privilege and this way of life but is he willing to give it up? Are we willing to give up, you know, certain comforts in, you know, in order to feel discomfort and to either feel more alive, alive or to make things easier for others or, you know, easier for others or easier for them to understand us. Yeah. Yeah. That, I feel like that scene in the beginning, definitely, you know, I, uh, the, his story also touched on like, just because like, Uh, he's smiling doesn't necessarily mean he's happy which is the case with so many people it's sort of that front that people put on and um the walls that Mm -hmm. both he and uh katie put up katie has this not necessarily a front because it is who she is this very strong you know self-empowered and just very bold person um and i feel like you know everyone teases her and whatnot and, and probably think that like oh she is incapable of love because she's too she's always angry i think he says that at one point too it's like why are you always angry she's like i'm not angry i'm just mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like, mm, sis are you um and <laughs> i also love that she you know sort of um took the l and said i didn't get a chance to tell you how good of a writer you are i'm sorry i waited so long to tell you that you know and congratulating and celebrating with him when he like sells a story and just very supportive she's like despite like, okay despite me thinking that you know uh, I was robbed. You still deserve your flowers for for the work you did, which is like very big of her because I feel like a lot of people would still be like, "Ugh, they're writing trash," you know. <laughs> <laughs> I see. I I agree. I I see. You're my friend. I know you, and I know what a big heart you have. So I know that you would have, in a way, taken that L and like complimented the other person. But I think don't give for me, me too much that's credit. one of the things. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think for me that that's one of the things that's always bothered me about the film that like she sort of like gave that up. So I don't know if I'm too inclined to agree, but then again, having been in a similar situation, I totally would have been like, whatever you say, Hubble, you know, like, you know, I'm just happy that you're paying me attention, which is like a sad and large theme of the film. Yeah. Okay, we've talked a lot about what we like. So is there anything about the film you didn't like? You did sort of just touch on like that specific moment, but uh, what comes to mind is something that you didn't like, whether story-wise or production-wise? Mm-hmm. Um, I find it hard to decide whether there are things that I don't like about the film because um, there's part of it that I, there's things I don't like because they make me feel terrible for Katie knowing what's coming and having experience, you know, that that same emotion or relationship. And I don't think it's necessarily because there's any bad plot decisions in the film. I think it's mostly the former. I don't really think there's anything bad. I just like in terms of, of storytelling besides the fact that I might not like how it ends or you know how certain characters acted but I you know given what you said about the making of the film and things that could have been inserted I would have loved to have seen you know maybe a little bit longer of the McCarthyism and the political elements because while people discuss that this is a love story and it very much is I think a lot of the political elements are so often forgotten and especially the scene where they're at the train station and they finally lay out, you know, what they both believe and what they, how they feel about principles and, you know, sacrificing them in the name of work or safety or uh, career advancement. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's, it's such a beautiful argument if, if you can even, you know, it's, it's interesting to put those two words together, but both sides make such a strong case and they, they both feel as passionately for the for the for once, I think that's the moment where Hubble stands up and is passionate, is fiery as fiery as Katie about what he believes politically in a way that they both need to draw the line and, and see, you know, what can be done because this was literally interfering with their livelihoods and and their futures. I, I think something I would have really liked is um there I feel like there was an absence of a uh, parental figure or a figure like mentor or comfort Katie or, as well yeah. as like Hubble, 
you know, through, through their, you know, both their perspectives. Mm. Um, and it would have been nice to, you know, even have had like the nerdy friend come back and like maybe been, you know, I feel like he's definitely interested in her, but have like him be sort of like rejected, but come back and show like a good example of like a non-negative, you know, male figure who's mm. able to understand that while there might, might be interest, he can be there as a support for her. It would have been nice to have an objective and like third, you know, perspective of Hubble and Katie, because I feel like while the film is centered in the way we were and it's told through memories and you can almost yeah. feel through like the music and the visual effects, you know, the transitions, you can feel almost like the blur of memories coming in of like, it makes you wonder, is this how it really happened? And so yeah. I- Is it a reliable sort of a narrator? Yes. Yeah. And so I think it would have been really cool to see those glimpses and flashbacks told, you know, maybe through an objective party as well. It's interesting reading some of the background of the film. There was quite a bit of struggle behind the scenes. Apparently, Arthur Lawrence, who wrote the screenplay, was not very happy with the first cut of the film. Oh. He is quoted, uh, he actually wrote in his memoir, he thought that it had a few good scenes and some good moments in bad scenes, but overall, he thought it was badly photographed jumbled mess lacking coherence because apparently there were up to 11 writers who came in to f touch up the script which he felt because uh, wow. apparently in the novel um hubble's role is not equal to katie's katie is more sort of in the forefront um because he wanted to sort of portray um a jewish hero but he wanted it to be a woman so he made it a, a, a you know Jewish heroine in the story, but then obviously having a star like Redford, it's like no, we have to give him just as much meat to it, sort of as much stake in the story, and he felt that it hurt the film. And apparently, uh, both stars appear, or he felt that both stars appear to be playing themselves more often than their characters. And Streisand used a grand accent, as he said, that Lawrence felt hurt her performance, which sort of goes in and out. The the very sort of strong Jewish New York accent sort of comes in and out throughout the <laughs> film, which is strange. Cause I thought like, oh, it'd be it'd make more sense if it was stronger when she was in college and it's sort of lost later, but it kind of veers in and out a little bit. Um, and then the director Pollock admitted the film was not good. He accepted full responsibility for its problems and apologized for his behavior. And then he retreated to the editing room to improve it as much as possible. And then Lawrence felt that the changes made it better, but it was never as good as it could have been, especially given the cuts that he probably was kind of bummed about. Um, and apparently there was talk of a sequel at one point, which is very interesting because I, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Like I just read that now um, as we were talking and I had no idea that that was actually things like, oh, you hope that like, you know, in the sequel, um, they and they do end up together. But um, apparently that's not really the case. Apparently um, it says uh, in the sequel, Hubble and his daughter, a radical like Katie would meet, but unaware of their relationship and complications would ensue. It's vague. Um, both agreed they did not want Pollock to be <laughs> part big. of the equation. Too vague. Um, and oh, wow. So they didn't want the director to come back because they were not happy yeah. with them. And aside from receiving a brief note acknowledging the actor had received it and looking forward to reading it, he never heard back from Redford again. He got ghosted. That's a very Hubble-like action. <laughs> Hubble -like action. It is. Um, wow. I. This is, you know, I, would you have wanted a sequel? I, I don't think I would have. I don't know. So apparently also in 1996, Streisand came across the sequel Lawrence had written and decided she wanted to produce and direct it as well as co-star with Redford, but did not want to work oh. with Stark. I did not know. Did you know Francis Ford Coppola is an uncredited writer on this? I did. I did read that. Yeah, yeah. he he contributed. Were a you bit. saving that for later? I'm so sorry. No, no, no. I actually I hadn't written it down. But um, yeah, it, the whole writing thing, you know, they, it goes through arbitration with the Writers Guild. Uh, I'm not sure if the Writers Guild existed back then. I'm sure it did. Um, but they sort of go through and they read every draft and see like, did you contribute enough to warrant you getting a credit, whether it's a story by credit or a written by, um, or you know, story editor things like that. But um, mm -hmm. Lawrence thought the script was not as good as he remembered it being and he agreed to write it once Stark agreed to sell the rights of the characters and their story to Streisand because he still owned, you know, the IP. Even though it was based on a novel, he owned like the film rights to the story, to the characters, the producer, uh, Ray Stark. And again, nothing happened. The following year, Stark asked Lawrence if he was still interested in adapting the original film for a stage musical starring Kathy Lee Gifford. Interesting. 
Lawrence declined, and any new projects related to the film have since been in limbo. He said, not Thank Kathy God. Lee. <laughs> yeah, she's kind of a... Oh, my gosh. Kathy Lee. But, well, you know what? I guess they will always remember the way they were. And, that's <laughs> <what> <laughs> and you can, and they can rent it like the rest of us on Prime Video, uh, <laughs> or or watch on TCM, which is what I did. Right. Shout out to TCM. No, no I'm kidding. So one thing that um, I and this isn't necessarily about this film; it's more about how Hollywood made movies back then. Is how perfectly lit every single shot in scene uh -huh. is like yes. yes they're glowing but i'm always the type just because i've worked in productions and whatnot it's like where does that light come from in this world i know there's a giant lamp above their heads like <laughs> off camera but like where is this light supposed to be coming from it just bothers me when you see lighting clearly change from like from angle to angle and from shot to shot it's like oh now she's perfectly lit from uh behind as well or the light that was behind her is gone it's just a sort of an an old school Hollywood filmmaking thing that's always bugged me. It's like when things are perfectly lit, when scenes at night have like the brightest, fullest glowing moon casting a massive light on everything. It's like, wait, what? What's happening? You, you super moon every night. Like yeah. what? You see every illicit activity done at night, you know, oh, probably in like <laughs> Gotham City or something. I don't know. They have very, I love when very people good like over there. Yeah, I love when people in a movie will like flip the light to go to sleep and then like a this harsh blue light comes. It's supposed to be like darkness. Obviously, you're supposed to you're just supposed to see things. But that was tongue twister. But um, still supposed to see things. Good Lord. But yeah, that's just honestly one of the few things that bother me. Of course, we'd have loved to see like, again, the McCarthy story fleshed out more and for Lawrence have had a bit more of a say in the story and in the production. But I don't know. I feel like sadly writers have like the least power unless they're a strong enough or a popular enough writer where they can also get like a producer credit and they get more of a creative say versus here's a script, do with it what you mm -hmm. will. Where's my check? You know. Uh, I feel that that's the that's the thing. Like when when you were bringing up Lawrence and just, you know, his his debate and issues, you know, with the film and the first cut, I was like, well, this man is never gonna be happy because like writers, you know, when the story's your baby and they sort of like put that in the movie you know with Hubble saying like this story is mine I know where it's from like I need to be able to work on it um I I think you know as writers we're just never going to be happy with the end result we're, we're right. going to see it it's going to come out we can be executive producer director writer anything and we're going to be like it just didn't happen these people I didn't have a good team you know <laughs> like something right. like that I wanted I wanted to ask because and now I'm asking questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I feel like I, I, I gave my favorite parts. Do you, and, you know, we're going into what we didn't like, not to veer too much away from that. We can we can finish that out as well. But is there something that you like? Like, is there on your first watch, like, is there a favorite part or like any lines that stood out that you liked out of the film? I mean, having only watched it once, it's like <laughs> I was sort of just watching to like observe the story and all of that. I feel like on a rewatch, I'll appreciate more individual moments because I'm not shocked or like, you know, mm -hmm. um, sort of that that factor goes out, but um, no specific lines come to mind. But just for me, one of the coolest aspects of it, and again, like as a musician and a man of the theater, it's like just the score and how much it added to the story and to what you're feeling. Because you know, there are these long shots where it's just like close ups and them looking longingly into the distance, and that theme swells and comes in. It just adds so much emotion behind what otherwise, if you mute it, you're like. Why are they just staring off into the distance for like 45 seconds? Like that's a long time of silence. Um, it's like, you know, one of my favorite movies, one that we have reviewed on the show, um, Halloween, the first time people saw that movie without oh. the score, they didn't find it scary at all. And then you add in that theme, that iconic do, 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 do. People are like, oh my God, what is this? Like they've never heard of music like that in a horror film. And similar with this is like big swelling theme after you've already heard Barbara sing it over like that, you know, the the credits and whatnot. Also, opening credits. I remember when I was watching it, um, Eric came into the room and was like, Oh, is it finishing? And I was like, No, remember when movies had opening credits like this? <laughs> he was like, Oh, these young that's right. they don't know. <laughs> in, 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 I'm older in soul. Um sure. what this is why I'm so glad that I brought up you know what my mom, you know, bought that soundtrack as a gift. Like that was my introduction to 
watching movies outside of my family, outside of something that they had bought or they had given me. You know, it was my first search of myself and it was what it yeah. would eventually make me who I am. And that's why I'm so happy to be a guest on this podcast. And that's why we're, you know, a that's huge tough. part of why we're like really good friends. You know, movies yeah. connect us. And I feel for me whenever I share a film and whenever I share a story or a song even, I, I'm i sharing a part of myself and what I'm saying to that person is, hey, I really like you. This is something that I care about and this is a way to understand me more. And I feel like that's what you do with your podcast and oh. your storytelling. It's a way to understand Juan Ayala more. And so the song, I mean, there could be an entire episode dedicated to that song, but really quick back to Halloween. I knew, I, I'd heard the Halloween score before, years before I'd even yeah. seen the film. So that's what's so instrumental pardon the pun about a film <laughs> score and what's you know is so necessary you know to just be resonant and you can recall it at the drop of a hat and really quick something you should check out and to to our listeners if you have not heard Beyonce cover the way we were in the Kennedy really? Center <laughs> honors tribute to Miss to Barbara Bar- Streisand oh you must go and hear that now yeah, literally, it it features Beyonce. I think she has like an updo because it, and and as an homage to to Barbara's yeah. hair, if I recall correctly, I may be wrong. And she killed that song. I need a studio version of it. So, um, listeners, you should go and check out Beyonce yeah. doing that tribute. I see it every Monday at show tunes. <laughs> <laughs> that is how I learned of it. It is an impeccable <laughs> cover, and I'm just glad that that's something I can say in this verse that I currently exist in. Um, so we sort of talked, I mean, you know, obviously the best performances in the movie are Streisand and Redford. The thing is, like, there's no real supporting cast in this movie. Like you said, there are no mentors or friends who were recurring throughout the whole movie. Um, there is mm-hmm. um, Hubble's ex-girlfriend who is still, like, around and she's with his friend now and yep. that whole thing. But um, there's no true, like, supporting characters. Like, if you think of, like, awards-wise, there's no one that would have a big enough role to go in. So are usually we ask like is there an underrated performance but there aren't really any to choose from sadly um even james wood's character is like very quiet he didn't have much dialogue um but yeah i i agree and and something i was looking at it 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 is really sad that there's no supporting characters but i think well there's there's really no room given for them to be fleshed out or to exist to like be alive but i think that was the studio's call and absolutely a decision that they talked about making such a vehicle for Redford and yeah. Bryson like that was what was going to make them the most money and get all the bank I actually think it would have been really lovely to have seen um was it Lois um she, she played uh Carol Carol Ann so I mean uh Lois Childs and she I think she was incredibly under un, underutilized I think that he could have been fleshed out. There could have been some more depth, some more complexity given to, you know, who is she? What it, what about her so alluring to Hubble after, even after having had such a complex and meaningful relationship with Katie that draws him back to her? And like, is she, you know, so many, back then, obviously the woman would have been blamed, but now we live in a different time where obviously it's Redford's fault that he stepped into that to begin with. And um, I, I think I would have just loved to have seen things from her perspective and seen, you know, a li- even there, there's. Is there a ship that's parking outside? What the fuck was that? <laughs> Sorry, keep going. <laughs> no, you're fine. What on I earth? think there, there's so many. What I love about writing and, and about film is. There can be, you know, a single glance of a camera. There can be a five-minute scene, a two-minute scene even, where it gives so much depth and nuance to a character, you know, and it, it adds so much more body to their performance and to the story, and it gives us a new eye. And so I think it would have been really cool to have seen just more of just just her perspective, her side. I mean, I really appreciated where they gave the scene uh, during the party at the uh, towards the beginning of the film where... And and what I loved was uh, Katie going, you know, oh, you know, you commented on my hair because she said there was something different. And she goes, yeah, you know, I I got it ironed. And in Harlem, I have actually have friends in Harlem. <laughs> and then, you know, uh, Carol Ann is like, I'm sure you do. Would you like me to disapprove? <laughs> and and so even that exchange gave us more 
of of some insight into who she is like maybe she is just this like this waspy bitch who doesn't like katie and like thinks she's above her but we we sadly we don't we won't get to know we don't know we don't have any insight to that yeah i love that exchange it was so brief but it kind of it really it you know it hit pretty hard because i feel like a lot of people say things like that when you don't see them for a few years like oh you haven't changed at all it's like neither have you like (laughs) you still view me as that person. So how have you changed if you're you haven't grown up enough to change your views on on the way someone presents themselves. And mm-hmm. it's funny, it's also the opposite when people are like, you've really changed. It's like, yeah, it's called growing up. But you know, it's like there's a there's a, a balance between the two, um, for sure. But um, it's giving, you know, like, what is like the teen movies where they get a makeover or like, the high school right. reunion, they come back and they're like, you're changed. I'm like, no, I didn't. I was always the same. You know, and they they walk out like triumphant glory like yeah so we sort of spoke about how the movie was definitely sort of like a pretty big influence on um carrie bratch on big's relationship and sex in the city so um we always ask sort of like has the movie characters plot lines anything like that had an influence on pop culture later and that's definitely a huge one i mean we've i feel like we've referenced that quite a bit with some of our personal friends in their relationships We're like oh they have a mr big or you know that's his mm-hmm. mr big right now or whatever but um, does anything else come to mind as like sort of broke out into pop culture all these years later? Um, I mean, for one, like, you know, really quick back to the song, I think everyone sort of knows or at least has heard yeah. of that song at least one point in their life. Um, I I think, I mean, the way it, it's, the sad thing is this is such a beautiful and important film that, like you said, it doesn't have the classic Hollywood ending it doesn't have the typical trajectory of love stories. I think we're so used to seeing happy endings. I, I, you know, I would even be, so what I think about the film that make, makes it stand out is the same thing that maybe is the reason a lot of people haven't flocked to it or don't know about it. And I mean, in younger generations. Yeah. Um, I mean, we have all our like set love stories. We have Titanic, we have, you know, Gone with the Wind, we have, all these films that don't end, you know, tied up neatly and they they have a, a mostly tragic ending. And I think we know those, but not this one specifically. And I I I think we should. I think it's such a beautiful film. And I think it 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 helps people, you know, relate, like like I said, you know, their different relationship issues or mirror and like, are you a Hubble or are you a Katie? You know, we don't we don't have that language, but I think we almost could if we went back to the film. I would almost be willing to be as bold as to say as which what I was going to say earlier that La La Land was influenced by this film. Oh, for in sure. In some ways, I think I think the ending, um, yeah. it especially at least well, definitely the ending, but the way in which and I, I'm so surprised we didn't touch on this yet. There, um, Hubble is on the boat with uh, JJ. I believe that's his, the friend of uh, the name of his mm-hmm. friend, and he, you know, is talking about their happiest times happiest months and then jj asks him like happiest year and the um hubble goes quiet as he's counting every single year that he's been with uh katie as a happy year and i i thought that was such a a poignant moment and even you know though they're happy that's that's just not enough but back back to your original question sorry (laughs) um I the the only way that I can think of and the reason I brought up you know the the film and how it's recalled in popular culture is because the way I heard of it was through Sex and the City and so that kind of helped prolong its legacy and its existence and that's how it expanded upon the the narrative and the uh, and the thesis of the film where you know they go into oh my god like this is this is very like Katie and Hubble he's Hubble like biggest Hubble and Carrie goes, I've had an epiphany. Like there's the simple girls and there's the Katie girls. And she, because she's asking her like, why she's asking herself, why her, why Natasha, you know, the pretty, like perfect, you know, waspy girl, yeah. which is a, a callback, you know, almost to the film. And I think that Carol Ann's role was almost expanded upon as Natasha and as the perfect girl and what, how she would have felt, you know, about yeah. her and Katie, him and her and big, um, and so, so I really think that that would be the, its legacy, its lasting effect that toxic relationships will always, you know, be portrayed in media because they will never die. Right. They won't die in real life. So it may as well keep <laughs> shining a light on them and providing a little guidance to people who might be going through a similar situation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, 
you know, obviously as a new fan of the movie, nothing really comes to mind, but um, just the fact that an artist like Beyonce not only would sort of cover it at the honors for Barbara, but also like, you know, record a version for new audiences to sort of, you know, um, to fall in love with, uh, with mm -hmm. that moment. It's like, uh, what is her name? She played Nina in In the Heights. She's a Latina singer, but I didn't know she had recorded oh. um, a bachata. Oh, Leslie Grace. Leslie Grace. Okay. Yeah, she had recorded a bachata version of Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow by uh, Carol King. Oh, like, my you know, God. it's artists bringing back. What? Yeah, it's so good. Listen oh, to it. It's I... like partly in Spanish. It's fantastic. Okay. I, I shared a gift with you. You shared a gift with me. <laughs> I will. I love Carol King, and I feel like I'm the only Latino who loves her. So this is like. Not true. I love her. Come on. Beautiful musical. I, Come on. I, now we know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Something else for us to geek out over. So on, at on the end of the Heritage day, Month. right. <laughs> so at the end of the day, I, we all, everyone listening knows the answer. Would you recommend this film to someone who's never seen it before? Uh, without a doubt. Yes. I think yes. it is essential. Is this, you know, if like they had to archive like a hundred, you know, of the greatest American films to, you know, to like, keep our uh history alive i feel like this is definitely in there as like one of the greatest romances it's like this in casablanca is like you know just oh. some of like the just the most like iconic films that and again this movie is sort of preserved in its history because it touches so much on our actual history and events that happened in that sort of like 15 year span of them between college and then uh you know being together and all of that but i just love how much it touches the history i'm such a history nerd i wanted to be a history teacher once upon a time so Hearing all of this was really, really cool oh. um, throughout the movie in a romance context. Like you don't see that usually. Usually romances are sort of like frozen in their time and they're not necessarily timeless. But I feel like because a lot of the issues that Katie is fighting for in the movie are still prevalent today, as we talked about with the strikes, you know, and all of that, it makes the movie timeless. It's like, oh, we've been dealing with this for a while. War, uh, labor unions, all of that stuff. Uh huh. I I agree. And also see, seeing that you spoke on the issue of time, I also wanted to point out, if I may, just one little thing that I also noticed mm -hmm. that there's this, this incredible scene where Katie is, you know, she's she's fighting, she's on the picket line, she's protesting, uh, as she should, you know, she's standing for her principles. And Hubble is back home with Carol Ann and JJ, and they're watching like you know, old recordings of, you know, his glory okay. days in college in yeah. literal black and white. And that stuck out to me on this rewatch, just the him representing being stuck in time potentially and representing the old and her being able, Katie being able to move on, you know, with newness and, you know, constantly striving for progress and being progressive herself and, and looking for, you know, bigger things. I have no doubt that with every civil rights movement, you know, even like, the Stonewall riots, you know, maybe Katie Murawski was there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she she threw a brick, like she she would have been there. Is and I think that's such a beautiful part of her that is why I resonate. What I reson resonate with the film, the film resonates with me both ways. <laughs> that she, you know, he he asks her, you know, you mustn't be too serious. You're beautiful, but you mustn't be too serious. Ugh. And that line drives me crazy because that's I think that's it, and that's what it's so basically about like all a... of us. Yeah, it's like a back. It's it's the it's basically seeing the same thing as like a smile more. Don't be so serious. Mm -hmm. Like, honey, don't 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 just don't just don't. Mm -hmm. Like, come on. Yeah, it's um. Uh, that's that's what makes her, and that's what makes us beautiful. You know, the seriousness is what's so such an essential part of us. And I, you know, it's such a sad thing that he wasn't alive. <laughs> yeah. Not her problem anymore. Right. Well, Anthony, thank you so, 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 so much for joining us on the show. Um, if any of our moviegoers want to give you a follow on social media, where can they find you? Um, they can find me at Staying Anthony on Instagram, where I'm routinely posting screen caps of movies and my favorite moments. I watch a movie pretty much every day. Thank you so much for having <laughs> me, Juan. Of course. And to all of you moviegoers, you can give us a follow at our main Instagram account, Actors with Issues, for all updates regarding our podcast. Give me a follow at Juan Ayala Official. And if you're watching on YouTube or listening on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever it may be, please subscribe to our show to never miss an episode. And if you enjoyed our chat, leave us a rating and review. Leave us a comment if you're on YouTube. Do you agree with us? Do you not agree with us? What do you love about the way we were? Let us know. 
I'm Juan Yala, and thanks for coming to the movies with us.